Celta presents Hear the World Differently. You're all very welcome to today's workshop, um, which is titled Changing the Narrative Around Refugees examining practice and meaningful engagement. My name is Stephanie Kerwin and I'm going to be one of the facilitators on today's webinar workshop. You're going to hear briefly from me around who we are as an organisation, Development Perspectives, you can see the banner in the background. Um, I think for many people this might be your first engagement with us as an organisation so we'll fill you in a little bit about that and we'll fill you in about the two projects that this workshop has been hosted as part of, SAILTA and STIRE. Um, so we'll just briefly talk about that. We'll talk briefly about SDG 16, Sustainable Development Goal 16, and that's what this workshop is being framed within. So peace, justice and strong institutions. Um, and I know Julie will talk a little bit more about that as well. You will get an opportunity to hear from our two speakers. So Judy Norman, who we will introduce shortly, who's going to talk more around the global context of um, this topic, and Razan Ibrahim, who will also speak to us around her background in journalism and narratives around um, refugee integration. Just to begin, I suppose, where this workshop came from, in development perspectives, we focus on one of the sustainable development goals every month. And for the month of June, we're focusing on SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. Um, some of you may not be aware of what the sustainable development goals are, um, and I'm not going to go into them in too much detail now, but there are 17 goals and this is one of the 17. And I would urge you to kind of look at them a little bit more. We have a lot of information up on our website. This topic really fits into this goal in particular. So this goal is around promoting just peaceful and inclusive societies. Um, and the work that you are all doing and involved in is very much feeding into this bigger global agenda. Um, which is at play and is being supported by 193 countries. So I think it's an important connection point for practitioners to know that the work that we're doing is feeding into a global agenda as well. But there is some goals in, or some targets in particular that this goal feeds into or that the work that we're doing and this topic feeds into a little bit more. So looking at things around legal identity, looking at things around decision making, um, institutions, what institutions feed into this into this theme. If you're new to development perspectives, our work, we are a development education NGO. We're based up in Drogheda and County Loud and we work within the adult and community education space. We work all over Ireland and then we work internationally as well. And our overall vision is to live in an equitable, just and sustainable world. And we try to do this through uh, transformative education and global citizenship education. So we do many different workshops, webinars, trainings. And one of the projects that's involved in this um, training is SAILTA, and that's a new program within Development Perspectives. It's a strategic partnership for the adult and community sector in Ireland. Um, and there's a number of organisations involved, including Irish Rural Link, AINTIS, Concern Worldwide, and Minuti University, and then Development Perspectives perspectives is leading the activity end of this so we do as you can see I'm not going to go into them but we do many different um, trainings and we, there's a lot of research and resources up on the website so we would encourage you to check in with that and see where maybe that can be of support to your work in the coming years as well we'd love to connect further on that end of things. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Maria who's going to talk about the other program that's involved in this workshop and then we'll move on with the training. Good morning everyone um, thank you, Steph. That was really comprehensive introduction of what DP is. First of all, my name is Maria Gonzalez. I'm a project coordinator for STIRE. One of them, the other one, it's Paul Crew, who is my colleague, and it's uh, on this workshop as well, behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smoothly. So STIRE stands for Supporting the Integration of the Resettled. It's funded by the European Commission, in particular the AMIF Fund. The duration of the project is two years. We're now in year two. The entire program is delivered by a consortia of six uh, European partners. So it's us uh, from Ireland, and then we have partners in Italy, in Croatia, in Slovenia, Romania, and Austria. Our overall aim is to work on social integration of refugees into their host communities. Last year, as part of the first year of the project, 
we conducted a, a research a needs analysis, which the main objective was to gather information to inform the activities that we're doing this year. I would like to introduce our two speakers of the day, which are the really the most important part of our workshop. First of all, we have uh, Dr. Julie Norman, who is a researcher and independent consultant, and she has a wealth of experience working uh, with refugees in different countries like Canada, US, UK, the Middle East, in Central Africa and Myanmar. So um, we, she will be touching base on what it's most, um, the global perspective around meaningful engagement and giving us that, that picture. And the other speaker of today is Rasan Ibrahim. She is an award-winning Irish Syrian journalist, which I think it's uh, particularly important. She's an advocate for global responsibility in integration and rights of Syrian refugees. Door to our first speaker, which is Dr. Julie Norman. So Julie, um, when you're ready, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you to Development Perspectives for organizing the event today. And thank you for all of you who are here joining in and listening either live or afterwards. As Maria mentioned, I'll be speaking on the global perspectives on refugee integration, um, based partly on my work, as Maria said, in the Middle East, in Central Africa, in Myanmar, but also in Europe and North America. Just to give a brief overview of what I'll be speaking to, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to who is a refugee and what global and regional trends are looking like in terms of forced migration. Um, I will speak a bit to SDG 16 and how it relates specifically to migration and to refugees. I'll talk a little bit about indicators of integration. So how do we understand or measure things like inclusion on, again, kind of this global level? And what are we learning about some of the challenges for inclusion, but also some of the best practices? And I'll close with just a few words about this current moment that we're at with COVID-19 and is this moment actually maybe unexpectedly creating some new opportunities for inclusion that we might not have expected. So I'll go ahead and start with just some figures at a glance of forced displacement in our world right now. These are the latest figures from the UNHCR, the UN agency that oversees refugees and forced migrants. And um, as you can see, it's, you know, forced migration is at a very high level right now in our world. Over 70 million people who have been forced outside of their homes. Um, just to note that over half of refugees right now come from just three countries, and that's Syria, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. And as a result, the countries that are most hosting refugees are those that are also bordering those states as well. So Turkey um, being a host to many Syrian refugees, um, Pakistan as a host country for many refugees from Afghanistan, and Uganda and Sudan as a host country for many refugees from South Sudan. And when people are displaced, and especially when they're forced to cross over a border, there's usually three sort of options that we think about that their future trajectory might look like. One is to return to their home country. So someone who may have been displaced again from say South Sudan to Uganda, and then is maybe some months or even years later able to return. A second option is integration. So for example, a Syrian refugee who has been forced into Turkey but who ends up staying in Turkey long term and trying to integrate there. And the third option is resettlement in a third country. So again, perhaps someone who has left Afghanistan to Pakistan, but then um, is able to resettle in, say, Europe or another country like that. So most, um, most refugees are usually in countries that are bordering their original state. But what I'll be speaking more to here is refugees and asylum seekers or persons seeking protection who have come to Europe. So those are individuals who are seeking resettlement and integration in kind of another country. And 
and aren't so much um, you know looking to return to their to their home country as those who are perhaps in border states might be. Just to clarify some terminology as well, within this you know large um, you know large population of people who have been forcibly displaced, um, over half are people who have been displaced within their home country. So internally displaced people are IDPs. So a lot of my work in, especially in Central Africa, are people who have been forced out of their homes but have not crossed an international border. And the UNHCR tries to provide services and and within country integration and inclusion um, programs and mechanisms for individuals in, in these communities. And the last, so to speak, category, which again uh, makes up a lot of the community of refugees in Europe, are persons who are traditionally called asylum seekers. Uh, sometimes now a uh, preferred terminology is persons seeking protection. These are people who are currently claiming refugee status in another country but whose claim has not been evaluated. So again, perhaps it's someone who has uh, fled from Syria or fled from somewhere like Afghanistan, has arrived in a European country and needs to um, essentially show that they have been fleeing from persecution, armed conflict, et cetera, to get what's called refugee status in that state. Before they have that, a lot of people are left in a sort of limbo and a very vulnerable position where they're seeking that status but don't have it yet. And so that makes a big difference for the extent to which we see inclusion and integration being able to be realized um, by people in that position. So I'll speak a bit more to that. Um, just again to zoom in a little bit more to Europe, um, currently in 2020, there's been close to 26,000 people seeking protection or seeking asylum in Europe. Those numbers are somewhat artificially low, largely because of COVID-19, um, probably about half and uh, less than half of what we would have seen around the same time last year. Um, current numbers for the last several years have, have been about 100,000 total for, for a year. Um, that's down from about a million peak in 2015. Again, though, even at its peak in Europe, um, with one million people seeking asylum or protection here five years ago, it's important to note that again, out of this global, um, you know, global group of over 70 million people who are forcibly displaced, uh, the number of people coming to seek asylum in Europe is relatively small within that. And I think that's just important to put in context because a lot of times in Europe, there was discourse around say, a refugee crisis or a migrant crisis. And, and in fact, that crisis could be said to be more of one of will rather than one of capacity, because the number of people coming and seeking protection in Europe is, again, relatively small compared to really the rest of the world. And there is capacity within Europe to help people integrate and to be included in a constructive and welcoming way. So I'll move on now to um, actually the SDG 16, which is our, our topic and our, our theme for today in the workshop. Um, again, the sustainable development goals are a larger framework of um, objectives and aims that are articulated by the United Nations, usually for 10 year periods. And it's kind of a policy orientation uh, to push for certain kinds of, of benchmarks of progress in all different areas, healthcare, education, institutions, everything. SDG 16 focused specifically on building peaceful, just, and strong institutions and also societies. And I do think it's important to underscore that the, the goal is for not just inclusive institutions, but for inclusive societies as well. And I think when we talk about refugees and asylum seekers, you, you really do need both. There's the institutional piece, and I'll speak to some of the progress that's been made there and some of the challenges. But you also need the societal piece and for more horizontal civil society, community level support also for inclusion and for welcoming. And we're seeing actually a lot of um, energy and focus at that level for, for migrants and refugees. I want to point out that SDG 16 doesn't refer specifically to refugees or forced migrants in its basic text. Like you can read it and see that. And yet within SDG 16, again, this concept of inclusion is so crucial for refugees, for those who have been forcibly displaced and for asylum seekers, just in its you know, basic kind of tenet. 
Within that, SDG 16, I don't have it on this slide, but it has a whole range of text within it that address different points. These include trying to address trafficking and exploitation, addressing corruption, um, rule of law, birth registration and legal identity, um, uh, effective institutions. So there's a lot within SDG 16 that touch on other themes that again, for refugees and for asylum seekers, many people uh, end up experiencing hardship or vulnerability in these areas in heightened ways. And so even though SDG 16 is not specifically calling out refugees and migration in its core text, we see that there's a lot to leverage within SDG 16 to improve inclusion and integration for refugees. I'll just um, go now to some of the indicators of integration that we traditionally have been looking to for how to build more inclusive societies for refugees and for persons seeking protection. And I'll speak a bit to how this has shifted to in kind of the global sector. Um, and traditionally, I would say really up until the last several years, a lot of the conversation and discussion has been almost um, putting the, the onus or responsibility on refugees themselves to gain language skills, to gain cul cu cultural knowledge, to build social bonds and social bridges. And all of those things are certainly important. And we obviously don't want to undermine the agency of individual and collective um, refugees and refugee communities to, to do those things. But there's starting to be what I think is an important pivot to look at the role of the state in being able to facilitate those kinds of things and to provide opportunities for those who are arriving to be able to gain those skills, to build those social bonds, to build those social bridges. So I'll speak a bit more to that in just a minute. But I want to focus really just on the, the top kind of four circles in this slide, which are kind of the key institutional um, indicators that we look for to see if people are getting the basic needs when they arrive in a country in terms of employment, housing, education, and healthcare. Now, as it's been alluded to already, one of the challenges with creating kind of a global, uh, um, having global inclusion across all countries is that different countries approach these things very differently. And that's even true within Europe and within the EU. So for healthcare and employment, for example, the extent to which refugees and definitely asylum seekers can access the labor market or can access national health systems really varies a lot by country. Um, countries that have been uh, quote unquote absorbing a lot of, um, of refugee communities have been even stricter on this. So in countries like Greece, for example, asylum seekers have essentially been unable to access the labor market or the healthcare system at all. In countries like Ireland and the UK, there's a bit more um, uh, official openness um, for employment, for example, um, once a person has been in Ireland for nine months or in the UK for 12 months, there's an ability to say, apply for a permit to work in, in some very specific sectors. But one, one has to wait for a very long time just to be able to apply. The application process is very long and the jobs that are available to one from that position are quite limited. So in reality, things like the labor market are quite restricted. Also with healthcare, um, even though some people upon arrival can access emergency care or perhaps maternal care, day-to-day um, -day care that one would expect is often quite limited. For housing also, for asylum seekers or persons seeking protection, in places like Ireland, people are put into a system called direct provision where they are placed in um, your kind of specific housing uh, settlement, so to speak and in the UK are put more in, uh, into immigrant detention centers. Once someone has that very crucial refugee status, they again, by law, technically can access the housing market, but we know in fact that um, migrants are actually, or, or refugees are overrepresented among the homeless population, largely due to discrimination in the market for rentals. And this is specifically true in places like Ireland and cities like Dublin, where housing is very expensive and very scarce, and we see a lot of competition. 
Um, people often assume that refugees get to quote unquote jump the queue. In fact, that's not the case. It's very hard for refugees um, and usually harder for them to access housing. Even something like education is probably the, um, the, the one the, 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 of these four institutions, the one that has the most widespread protection around it. Um, across the EU, education is supposed to be protected not only for refugees, but also for asylum seekers. But again, what we know in reality is that it's very difficult sometimes for children or young people, especially those who are living in detention centers, to access education um, in terms of being able to go to school or to access sufficient education. That can be for a number of factors. Um, there was, even within Ireland, investigation last year into the fact that many children living within direct provision were not being able to access schools. Even some of those who were, were facing challenges in terms of barriers to registering, in terms of lack of support for psychosocial support or for language support. And so there's a lot of other things that we're seeing need to happen than just having something written on the books. It's something that's good to check off. And maybe for, you know, for our SDG formats, we, we you know, will say, oh, education has, has been guaranteed. But what we really need to start looking for is how that's actually being realized and being accessed by people who need it most, because that's where the inclusion and integration comes in. Access to permanent residency and or citizenship can really be crucial for fostering inclusion and cohesion in host societies. But we know that there's so many barriers that prevent migrants and their children from accessing residency and citizenship, again, even once they have refugee um, status. Those can include just an absence of pathways. So again, the UK, for example, will sometimes give temporary refugee status, which again is well-intentioned and is trying to help those who are you know, fleeing um, from the worst conflicts and whatnot. But it puts people in a situation where they aren't able to work towards the, the, the rights that they would have as residents or citizens. Um, other kinds of barriers include unnecessarily long wait, sometimes five years or more before being able to apply for these things. Very heavy fees, sometimes 1,000 um, pounds or euros or more. Um, onerous uh, exams that one has to pass before they can become a resident or a citizen. So there's a lot of things that, uh, that can be done better in this regard. Um, some of the best practices that we're seeing in this then are, again, just having accessible pathways to residency and citizenship to begin with. Canada has a pretty good model on this in terms of um, really from, from very early on, refugees are start on a pathway to residency rather than having to wait, say, five years as they do in some European countries. Even the United States has taken steps to waive or partially waive fees for um, residency and citizenship for people who are vulnerable, and that's something that could be taken on by other states as well. And quite crucially, especially in Europe, um, having automatic access to citizenship for children of those who have come as refugees could make a very big difference. In North America, this is usually a given. Someone who's born in Canada or in the United States regardless of who their parents are, are automatically a citizen just by being born on the soil of that country. Traditionally, that's not the case in most European countries. And that creates a real challenge for children of refugees who are born into that country, who don't have any kind of documentation from their parents' home country, but also aren't given any kind of citizenship papers for the country that they are born into. So that creates a real challenge, again, for young people in particular, and just this one shift of policy could make a big difference for that generation. As I mentioned before, we've seen places that have targeted programs to help migrants and refugees with skills necessary for employment and residency have proven to be very successful. Portugal has a very good integrated model that um, others are looking to right now. And Scandinavia has also had a good history of this also. And finally, again, just when there is an absence of that national state level um, uh, um, citizenship, having more cities and local levels step in with some kind of inclusion or some kind of identity basis can help a lot. Um, this is what's also often called the, the places of sanctuary movement or in North America, the sanctuary cities movement. And again, this is where networks of 
groups, um, sometimes including state officials, sometimes not, um, try and create an inclusive community for refugees and um, for asylum seekers. And again, Ireland is a really good model for this. There's nearly a dozen places of sanctuary throughout both the North and the South that are providing a really good model for this community-based support. And I'll just close with a few thoughts for this current moment that we're at with COVID-19. Um, we saw as early as March a host of UN agencies calling for the protection of forced migrants during COVID-19. And surprisingly, we saw a number of states kind of step up. Many EU countries released individuals who were being held in immigration detention centers. Uh, places like Ireland and also Portugal extended their health care and social services to all foreigners and undocumented immigrants, um, which, again, was, as we know, had, had many barriers in the past. Italy has what's no one's quite sure how this is going to play out just yet, but has passed an amnesty law for um, a certain number of people, at least, to get temporary work permits and legal residency. And again, we've seen a lot of cities, of communities, of state-based efforts to provide relief to those who are vulnerable um, because they're not covered through some of the social services that states are offering their citizens and residents during COVID-19. So again, a lot of these are very temporary measures, so we should be um, you know, cautious in how optimistic we are about them. But it does show that when there is a will, these things are possible. I'll close with just one quote from Patrick Tarrant from the Global Migration Policy Associates, where he says, normal and right shouldn't be seen as exceptional. And I think that's true. We're celebrating a lot of these um, you know, provisions and policy changes that have been made under COVID. But we can see that, again, when states want to do these things, they can, and they go a long way to building integration and inclusion for refugees and asylum seekers. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions after the second speaker. Thank you so much, um, Julie, um, for sharing your experience with us and, and also for providing so much, uh, so many strong facts uh, and so interesting. I'm going to uh, present our next speaker which is Rasan. Um, so Rasan is going to um, share her experience in terms of um, narratives uh, and how can we um, shape the narratives to be more inclusive of refugees as well. So Rasan, um, I think you are also going to share your presentation. So when you're ready, the floor is all yours. Good morning, everybody. I am so happy to be with you today. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, for your great presentation and for giving us this overall and important perspective of the refugee status uh, in 2020. And thank you so much as well, Maria, for uh, all your um, effort and for development perspective for organizing this important workshop, especially actually at this time the narrative shouldn't be lost. We should always keep talking and keep the conversation around refugees. Because today, as uh, Dr. Jolie mentioned, today uh, the 1% of the population are refugees and they are forcibly displaced from their countries. So that's why it is really important to keep the conversation and as well tackle um, any misinformation, any negative um, perspective around refugees. So today I'm going to speak about my background, experience in journalism, and as well, I'm going to talk about refugees in Ireland and how we use social media and media in general to uh, give real representation of refugees in Ireland and even across the world. So um, I came from Syria in 2011. All my life, I wanted to be a journalist, but the most important thing for journalists and any journalism is freedom. And unfortunately, I come from a region where we don't have freedom. So when I was living back home, I tried few attempts to be a journalist, but I knew I, sh I, I mean, I can't be a parrot or I can't be associated with anybody. I want to be independent and I want to, to have my own voice and the voice of the people. So I totally uh, kind of uh, forgot 
this idea to be a journalist till I came to Ireland. So I came to Ireland to do my master's in English language teaching, but the violence um, and the war escalation in Syria made me seek asylum in Ireland. And I became a refugee um, in 2013. And uh, since then, of course, like I started my life from zero, from scratch. I moved from Limerick and uh, to Dublin, where I currently work as assistant editor in Storyful News Agency. So what we do is fact checking, uh, tackling misinformation, verify content on social media. And my particular work is as well to um, report on human rights uh, abuse, on violations, war zone areas in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and across the region. And as I said, like freedom is so important, uh, especially for a journalist. And that's why like I felt I can do that here in Ireland. I can have a voice and I can have impact on people. So I'm going to go through uh, with you, like, first of all, just like really basic, the five core principle of ethical journalism, accuracy, independence, impartially, humanity and accountability. So these kind of the basic human and ethical principles that we, any journalist or any uh, media NGO should follow when reporting on refugees. And there should be respect of the five point guideline on refugees and migration. Facts, not bias, uh, know the law in the country, and the law to protect the refugees and their in, uh, dignity and their privacy, uh, show humanity, speak for all, and challenge hate and stereotypes. And this is a crucially important. This is where I'm going to expand more in my presentation. So when we talk about refugees, it is really essential to uh, be able to write and report on the correct terms that we use. Migrants are different from asylum seekers and asylum seekers as well are different from refugees. So it is important when we report to know and to pick the right term that represent the people. And it's as well very important to avoid some terms that actually I personally saw these in across the media in the world, and I'm, I'm, I believe you as well, where we see describing uh, refugees as crisis, as refugees are flooding, there is invasion or hordes, etc. These terms are not only wrong, they are dangerous. And you should be really, really careful not to use them. And especially like we see polit politi uh, politicians, they are using these terms to create fear among the people. And this is where we should stop. This is where we should tackle this narrative and use the real terms, the more positive, uplifting terms uh, to describe the refugees, the reality as well, which is that's important, the fact and reality of the refugees. It is important as well, I believe, to uh, report on personal stories where I'm going to ex expand more later. But at the same time, behind each one of these personal stories, there is more complex background. And this complex story where they come from, from war, from complex war, brutal war, conditions, um, discrimination. This is as well should be highlighted. So make it easy as well for public who are not aware, make it easier for them to understand these complex stories um, behind the stories of, of people and personal uh, stories. One of the things I believe that in general, we should focus more on is uh, women refugees. We don't see women refugees represented like enough in the media. And we can see like there is, the visibility is limited in general. Uh, so that's why telling the stories of women, um, their experiences before 
how they came to the country, the contribution they are making uh, as women, as girls, as students, as, as all, all like part of the life, it is really important and should be giving um, like priority attention, I believe, from the media, especially to break these stereotypes on refugees that all refugees um, are young men which is not true, like half of the refugees, let's say in Greece right now, are women and children, but we don't see them. We don't hear their voices. This is where we should tackle this and represent women more in the media and in our um, reporting. And there is something important when we write about refugees. It's not only a story of um, like where they come from, their experiences, it is important to have their voice and to quote their voice, not only writing about them, actually let them speak and quote what they are saying, because this is real. This is uh, from, uh, from um, experience and it has more effect on people when they use their own words and their own um, experience. I'm going to speak hear about the social media and storytelling why it is it's important like whether we like it or not social media right now is taking all the space in in the world like even even taking the space from from newspaper and from uh, tv channels and the news channels it, it is highly influential tool let's use it let's take advantage and use it for a better connection with the people and um, stories on social media like usually especially on twitter on facebook um i'd say we can make it short story very very specific precise and with a content show it and tell it show the story and as well with a short precise and specific caption that would have an enormous impact on the people. So because it's very short, people they read it very fast and they got the message and they engage like instantly with the message. For example, I'm just bringing here an example of a, like a story I didn't at all expect to have impact. Um, it was about a child uh, called Ali. He came from Syria and I visited his mom after she gave birth in, in Dublin. And I just took this photo and I, get, I got permission from the parents to share the photo. And they agreed. So I just thought like Syrian short story. Ali was in his mother's womb when he crossed the sea. Um, uh, Ali opened his eyes in Rotanda Hospital in Dublin. Very short, very specific, and it tells a lot of suffering and a lot of hope at the same time. Like people imagine the mom pregnant, crossing the sea and arriving to Greece for a few months and then finally arrived to, uh, to Ireland and a new life was born in Ireland. So this is kind of small messages, small um, like social media stories uh, that they usually have impact on people and, and I, uh, as I said before, especially when it comes um, on women and children, it will it always have a positive impact on the audience. But we have to be careful as well. Um, when we do reporting and when we even if it's positive and it is getting a positive message, positive news, uplifting, we need to be careful as well what photos we use. How do we connect this news, this piece of news to, to the right picture or to the right content? For example, recently, the Irish Times, they um, reported on really positive news where 200 Syrians um, cleared to travel to Ireland when coronavirus restrictions are being lifted. Beautiful and really positive news. However, the photo connected with this uh, piece of news, it gave a wrong impression. And it didn't give what, or, did, or I'd say it didn't reflect what this news is saying. This photo, it doesn't, um, so as I was mentioning that the Syrian refugees are coming from Lebanon, 
Okay, this photo is not from Lebanon. It is from a northeast Syria coming from um, a camp, Al Hol camp in Al Hasaka. And I have worked on this particular story for one year where Al Hol camp is uh, mainly right now hosting Daesh or uh, Islamic State um, uh, related families, etc. This image would give straight away uh, uh, bad, bad connotation, it will, the voices of Islamophobia will rise, the voices of racism will rise. So it is responsibility when we report to know what, what can we, what uh, pictures can we use. So actually I contacted the Irish Times and I explained to them that this is giving a wrong message to the audience and it will um, raise criticism and fear among the people and they changed it to another picture and uh, um, it's from um, Lebanon um, at least there was a change that's why I encourage really people when we see something that is not right that we should act we should send messages messages it's responsibility I think from us not to st step back and just watch we can contribute we can make a change with really small steps. Um, I, I like to change that and make it more positive stories, not a fearful story. As I said to you, like before, um, tackle and challenge uh, hate and stereotypes. It is really essential when we write about a story, especially um, this all um, kind of narrative about refugees. They are um, sponging the system. They are coming here to take our money, to take our jobs. Or they say uh, women refugees are um, oppressive, for example, are, are not treated well, for example, or about religion. So it is, I think, our duty as uh, from NGOs, from media and journalism to tackle these stereotypes and smash them, literally smash them. We have really good examples of people, let's say from um, examples from Syrian women. And we can see uh, uh, in the first uh, picture, Alma Harrak, Alma came to Ireland and she taught as a refugee and she taught herself how to play the piano um, from YouTube. And she played with the Irish orchestra um, in 2019, so on, on public stage. So this is really powerful story of a woman, a Muslim woman, but still strong and contributing and creative. Another story of um, another really amazing woman called Rezan. I, I didn't bring this example just because we have the same name, but because she's really, really impressive uh, young girl, uh, she wins uh, an uh, award from a Garda division because she was helping her community in, in uh, to like even not only Syrian community, helping two communities to connect together. So she did amazing job. So this is another way of tackling these stereotypes on gender, on religion, and labor, and education. For example, um, we always say it, like even our people, especially on social media, they are, you are taking our jobs, you are sponsoring the system, you are on social f welfare, etc. It's important that when we see examples of people having their own businesses, they are creating su successful careers in Ireland to highlight these experiences and, and to make them really obvious to the world and to Irish audience that no, people are here to contribute, to start a new life and to be successful like anybody else. A new to the parish. This is one of the great examples in Ireland where there is a dedicated uh, column, dedicated um, section in the Irish time for a newcomers, new Irish, new perspective, starting their lives in Ireland. It's incredible, I think, how these stories are all connected in one, um, in one column. And um, I think like Sorka Pollock, the journalist in the Irish Times, she has been doing incredible job. I think she's maybe the only journalist 
who is literally dedicated to highlight these positive stories, to highlight the people's experiences, their potential, their backgrounds, and make the audience, uh, the Irish audience as well, connect to them and eventually feel that actually we are the same. So this is really important. She re she did amazing stories on Syrian refugees, Kurdish refugees, um, Black Lives Matters, um, like really incredible um, reporting on that. There is another journalist which as well highlighted really good stories, Philip Cromwell. He did a really good uh, reporting on uh, refugees and and we see here Lorca dancing Irish dance. She arrived through community sponsorship program to Ireland and we see as well um, a Syrian man started his own business, his own bakery and the story was extremely successful. So his person has started a new bakery paying taxes, employing people, and contribute, contributing to the Irish society. So these kind of the examples, when we see, they change the narrative, they tackle hate, they smash the stereotypes, and they make the people, the Irish people, connect to, to refugees, connect to their suffering, but most importantly, to their potential and to their hope. They are contributing. Uh, to Ireland. As I mentioned before, social media is a crucial in uh, telling the stories of refugees and, and highlighting their experience uh, in Ireland. Um, and uh, like, as I always mentioned, like, you don't need, uh, for example, a um, professional camera to do your reporting. You don't need uh, professional equipment if you have them, that would be brilliant. If you don't have them, use your mobile phone. I literally, when I do reporting, let's say, on I did recently BBC and, um, reporting and report on coronavirus in Ireland, I haven't used any professional camera. It was only my mobile phone. So the, we have it. Everybody has it. So we don't really need professional to make a good story. Good story is a good story anyway. We can make it better with the video, uh, your mobile phones, and then with the right description and and like telling the story in um, specific, but at the same time, uplifting and positive way. And if you, if you don't have, for example, enough stories here, we have the online. Online is open to everybody. So we have open sources across the social media. I uh, even personally, uh, when I do my, my, even my work in Storyful, we have open sources on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, etc. Just simply, if you see an important story, uplifting story from a refugee in Ireland or even from any other country in the world, connect them, try to talk to them, uh, get permission to use a video or a photo they have, um, identify and verify location and the date for this specific story or in general. So these are the core, the three core in verifying the content. Discover an interesting story, connect with the people, get permission to use their content and verify location and date. So, I mean, as I said, you, only, you don't only need to go to the people and film them and um, take photos or videos. If this is not available, we have social media and we have the open sources that we can use. And um, uh, as well for any journalist, and NGO database is very important. Uh, keep keep them, de keep uh, contact of the people, their phone numbers, social media accounts, especially people who are willing to speak, who are willing to share their experiences. That is, would be like really important when we have a, a time story, which is sometimes when the story um, is happening right now, it is important to, uh, match the story with the timing. For example, uh, Sorka did uh, was reporting on coronavirus, but she wanted to highlight as well the um, uh, refugees and and as well the immigrant experience. That was a perfect time to highlight how coronavirus in Ireland and immigrants 
uh, doctors from different backgrounds are helping to tackle this national and international crisis. So this is as well the timing of the story is crucial when we do, when we help to change the narrative um, on refugees. So this is um, like an overall um, uh, like idea of in journalism and how we can use the voices of refugees more positively, more effectively, and how we can use social media in uh, telling their stories in more related and affected way. We say in Arabic, shukran jazilan. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me and I'll be very, very happy to listen to your questions, notes and uh, any ideas uh, that you would like to share. Thank you so much. Brilliant, Rasan. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was extremely interesting. So we have uh, first some questions for Julie. Housing is a major barrier for people who have been granted refugee status. Um, so many people are forced to remain, remain in the reparation centers as they cannot source accommodation. What can be done to overcome this? This is a question from Regina. Yeah, so this is a real challenge right now. And this, again, to me, is one where I think we can see both like horizontal and vertical efforts. So that is like the state can do more to try and ensure that there is more accessible housing to um to people in general is including um, but not limited to refugees but also we see we can see more support from community organizations and helping newcomers navigate what are very difficult and tricky housing markets so what um, our MRCOs or migrant and refugee community organizations can really take a leading role in trying to help people just one just determine where and how to find housing but also working with landlords and renters to try and um, use the kind of stories that Razan was so um, wonderfully sharing to try and decrease the discrimination and the stereotypes that we see on that side that is making it harder for people to access um, accommodation. Brilliant. We have another question for um, Razan. Uh, this is a question from Paul. How challenging is it, it is to combat misinformation and in some cases flat out lies when in many cases messaging is now strategically targeted at specific people, especially on social media, for example, Brexit, Cambridge Analytica? It's hugely challenging, Paul, and I can tell you I work on social media analysis. This is as well big part of my work, um, like follow a misleading campaign, hashtags on Twitter and uh, like social media campaigns in general. And we can see how these campaigns, especially when it comes from a specific like uh, political opinion, they are um, organized, orchestrated uh, by many uh, misleading information fake accounts, etc., etc. So this is really crucial and important um, thing to highlight. Um, I think just really follow this, uh, uh, what, what we do, like especially in my work, identify uh, these uh, campaigns, these fake misleading hashtags, for example, and um, analyze them and then um, just I, th I think connect with um, social media platforms when we identify huge misleading information or a huge uh, campaign, misleading campaign or fake campaign. It's important to when we see something to, to say it out and, and to tell the platforms. Sometimes we don't have answers, but at least we can say this on our social media, on our platforms and make people aware that they shouldn't engage with something not authentic. So, I mean, extremely challenging. And unfortunately, because we don't have enough um, kind of supervision uh, over social media, we are seeing this a lot. And um, a lot of right-wing uh, anti-immigration are using social media to, to spread hate and fear among the people. This is where we our work comes this is where we should be um sharing uplifting positive good stories um for people to tackle the other narrative 
Well, thank you so much to both of you. Your um, presentations have been extremely interesting and I'm echoing as well all the positive feedback that we're receiving in our chat box. People are very thankful and um, they seem to be very happy about the, what they heard today. And we hope um, the messages that we received today will really provide with helpful information for everyday practice. I'm sure we are all taking at least one key message from our session today. I would like to thank you again, all of you, and um, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Stephanie. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, and just to echo a huge thank you to Julie and Roseanne for their time and their commitment and their passion. And I would recommend that you follow the links that I shared um, to both the work um, that Julie and Roseanne are involved in and both are very active on social media. So thank you both. CELTA presents Hear the World Differently.